dulce bando sostiene. Angelingua gloriosi, per elium certa minis, et suo per crucis trofeo, dictrium fum nobile, qualiterre Good evening. Welcome to the Newman Center. We're happy to have you here this evening as we begin this new series on the spiritual life, uh, guided by Saint Therese of Lisieux and the story of a soul. Um, we'll be meeting for five weeks and on a bi-weekly basis, more or less. And the, the desire, the prayer for all of us is that by reading her book, together and reviewing the chapters and some of the questions in a contemplative way that we may be able to draw closer to God through her intercession and come to understand the little way, which is a very powerful way to becoming closer to God. Let us begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saint Therese, flower of fervor and love, please intercede for us. Fill our hearts with your pure love of God as we approach it as we approach this moment together, please help us to become more aware of the goodness of God and how well he tends his garden. Instill in us your little way of doing ordinary things with extraordinary love. Give us the heart of a child who wonders at life and embraces everything with loving enthusiasm. Teach us your delight in God's ways so that divine charity may blossom in our hearts. Little flower of Jesus, 
we bring all of our petitions to you before God, our Father. With your confidence, we come before Jesus as God's children, because you are our heavenly friend. As we celebrate uh, this time together, and this feast also of the chair of Peter, that both of you will intercede for us, so that our hearts, our minds, our whole lives will be firmly fixed on heaven, where you wait for us. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Wonderful. So, again, so thank you for being here. People are going to be uh, arriving a little bit at a time, which is fine. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to begin by presenting uh, a background on the life of Therese of Lisieux. And as you had received in an email last week, you were asked to read chapters one and two. If for whatever reason you are unable to, don't panic. But I do ask that for the following sessions that you do read the assigned chapters prior to arriving. So that way uh, you'll be able to contribute more also during the sharing session, which will take place after the teaching. Let us begin. At that time, the disciples approached Jesus and said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child over, placed it in their midst and said, amen, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. St. Therese was known for her goodness, but she accomplished so little that a fellow nun worried about uh, what would they'd have to say at her eulogy right, during the funeral. And the sister was heard saying, she has certainly never done anything worth speaking of. Could you imagine? Therese was asked by her mother superior to write her life story, which she dutifully did, expressing in simple language her philosophy of life, right, which came to be called the little way. This little way meant living with a childlike sense of wonder at God's gifts, with a child sense of dependence and trust. Published after a year, a year after her death, the book became a surprise and instant bestseller, translated in over 30 languages. Little Therese was born near the end of a century in which Nietzsche pronounced that God is dead, the century when Darwin announced his discovery that man descended from apes, the century when the workers of the world were starting to unite around a revolutionary manifesto by Karl Marx. The saint God chose to raise up in the century was a bourgeois girl who entered a Carmelite convent at 15 and who died of tuberculosis less than 10 years later. Could you imagine? So she was living in a very difficult period, but as we see in God's goodness, that he always responds and he does it through raising up saints. Canonizing her between world wars at a time of social unrest and uncertainty, um, Pope Pius declared that if everyone followed her little way, the reformation of human society would be easily realized. Could you imagine? The reformation of human society would be easily realized. So we hope, at least for us here present this evening, that we'll be able to commit ourselves uh, to going deeper into the doctrine of the little way, and hopefully by having our lives transformed for the better, that we can also evangelize other people more effectively. A few years after that, Pope Pius XII called her the greatest saint of modern times. This is what St. Agnes of Teresa of Calcutta chose as her patron and not St. Teresa of Avila, the bold reformer and mystic. Agnes chose the path of Therese the Little. Born roughly a decade after little Therese died, Mother Teresa took up the Carmelite's torch and bore her little light farther down the, the trail into the dark recesses of the modern world. And she's been a source of inspiration for many other saints, including St. Faustina Kowalska. In her diary, St. Faustina related how as a novice, she was going through some difficulties and she did not know how to overcome them. So she started in Novena to St. Therese of the Child Jesus, and since she had a great devotion to her. On the fifth day, she dreamt of St. Therese. And Therese told her not to be worried about the matter, but that she should trust more in God. At first, St. Therese hid the fact that she was a saint, and she said that she suffered greatly too, but St. Faustina did not quite believe her. 
the little flower assured her that she had suffered very much indeed and told Saint Faustina that in three days the difficulty she, had, she was having would come to a happy conclusion. At that moment, Saint Therese revealed to her that she was going to become a saint. Saint Faustina then asked her if she was going to heaven and become a saint when raised to the altar like her. The little flower assured Saint Faustina that she would become a saint like her, but that she must trust in the Lord Jesus. Um, just yesterday, I finished the novena for all of those here present, and it was to ask God for the grace to be able to receive the gift of contemplative prayer and also to be able to live the doctrine of the little way and also uh, a novena to Saint Elizabeth of the Trinity so that we can learn to, to understand the depths of, uh, of the Trinity that lives within us through baptism. So who was Therese? These are some photos of her. She was absolutely adorable little girl. Just some points here. Uh, she was born on January the 2nd, 1873. She was baptized two days later. Her mother died in 1877, which had a profound impact on her life. Her sister Pauline uh, became a Carmelite nun. She entered on October 2nd, 1882. And Pauline was her second mom, which had, again, a profound impact on her. And then she had the, the miraculous healing, which she received through Our Lady's Smile, the statue which continues uh, to, to be um, housed at the monastery, the convent in Lisieux. She received her first communion on May the 8th, 1884. She was confirmed uh, shortly thereafter. And then she had her Christmas conversion. And then the audience with Pope Leo XIII begging him to uh, dispense her of the age requirement so that she can enter into the convent. She enters into Carmel a year later. She receives the habit and professes her vows. Then her father, Louise, dies, Saint Louis Martin. She enters the infirmary and then she dies on September the 30th. Her autobiography, Story of a Soul, is published um, a year later. The cause of beatification is introduced in Rome. And this is uh, relatively short. Nowadays, we think, okay, well, there are many people that are canonized within a few years, which is extremely rare. Um, however, it would be four, it was hundreds of years, at least 50 years. So Tres was one of the first to be beatified quickly. And then she was canonized on May the 17th, 1925, and declared a doctor of the church, on October the 19th, 1997. Now, who are the Martin? Well, some interesting facts. So one of the books that I recommend in, at the end of this is this one over here called The Hidden Face. And it is a, a study of the life of St. Therese of Lisieux. And there's some, there's some very interesting information on her siblings and on her parents in particular. And uh, so both her parents had attempted uh, in, to enter into religious life. And interestingly enough, both were rejected. Her father was said to be too old and he also, um, they were concerned that he wouldn't be able to keep up with the requirements, the academic requirements. And her mother wasn't um, discouraged after being rejected by the nuns, but she was ever more determined to raise a family and to lead her children to serve God in a worthy way as religious. And she received that grace. They eventually met in Alessand and then they got married. They were older for that uh, time. And then they began their remarkable voyage through life. Within 15 years, they, uh, Zélie born, uh, born nine children, seven girls and two boys. And not all of them survived, but uh, they were all um, filled with joy, and the, the couple, and they had a deep love of their children. They brought them much happiness. And of course, the sorrow that comes from having lost the two boys, uh, for four of the children and the two of their daughters. We can see here that... Uh, Marie got her, Zelay got her wish, so that all of her daughters ended up entering into religious life, and both husband and wife were eventually canonized. Four of the children again died, and again, this, in spite of this tragedy, they poured out all their love for Marie, Paulin, uh, Leonie, and Céline, and their newborn, and they um, gave the name Marie Françoise uh, Thérèse Martin, and who came to be known as the little flower, Therese. 
Zelie and Louise were declared saints on October the 18th, 2015. And there are some beautiful uh, biographies that you can, um, you can access on their lives as well. And the letters, right, the correspondence between the two of them. Just a very brief overview, and we'll get into much greater detail as we go through the diary itself. So in the early years, so Therese was born again on January the 2nd, 1873. She was baptized two days later. And when she writes in her diary, she says, all my life, God surrounded me with love. My first memories are imprinted with the most tender smiles and caresses. Those were the sunny years of my childhood. How blessed, eh? how blessed for this child to be born in a family, right? A mom, having a mother and a father and siblings that were filled with love for God and for each other. And Therese, right, 21 years later, she described her home life in Amazon, France. She said it was her happy disposition contributed to making uh, her life most pleasing. Now, during her school years, right, so in 1881, she enrolled, uh, she was enrolled uh, at the, as a boarder in this year's Benedictine Abbey School. And she hated the place. She said that the five years that she was there were the saddest of her life. She worked hard and she loved her catechism, history and science, but she had trouble with spelling and mathematics. And you would have seen that um, had you read chapters one or, and two as well. She makes some reference to that. And I have some quotes as we go uh, further on. And her keenness arose the envy of many fellow pupils and she paid dearly for academic successes. So she was absolutely miserable when she was there. So Marie Martin, so the oldest daughter of the family, joined her sister Pauline in the Zio Carmel in 1886. And then um, her sister Leon entered, Leonie entered the visitation convent a year later. Therese then sought permission from her father to join her sisters in the Zio convent. Now, three of his girls had already entered religious life. Although he was very generous, um, he not only granted Therese's request, but he also worked zealously to help her realize it. And that's how we find out later when they go to Rome. So, and then after her life there, and then after her death, of course, and we'll go into great detail over the next few weeks. And then, so after all of that, and so she's, she's canonized, and then Pope St. John Paul II makes her a doctor of the church, right? So popularly known as a little flower, so she becomes the third woman to be named a doctor of the church following St. Catherine of Siena and St. Teresa of Avila. So on average, the previous 32 doctors of the church lived to be 64 years of age and the youngest having been St. Catherine of Siena at the age of 33. Therese died at 24, she became the youngest doctor of the church. And besides her autobiography, she also wrote two volumes of letters, some poems, prayers, and eight plays as well. So how do you become a doctor of the church? Well, she, had, she demonstrated outstanding holiness and sanctity, eminent learning and her writings, the proclamation by the Pope. And of course, she's a canonized saint. So all these requirements are necessary. And it's so important that what she had to say, what God had to say through her is something that everyone in the world, so all Catholics, all Christians and all people of goodwill can learn from. And I have a good friend of mine who's a, a Protestant minister, and he loves Therese of Lisieux. He has a deep devotion to her. So I want to begin now by delving into her diary. All right. So a bit of a backstory now. This is something that was published by Joe Sparks. It's a very cursory overview of what you can find again in here. And also the context of holiness, which is another book from Father Mark Foley, which I would also recommend. So these are some direct quotes from his story, um, from his article. What he says is that when in 1898, her edited autobiography was published, it became an instant classic, captivating the imaginations of millions. Yet the portrayal of St. Therese in that original publication was limited. Please understand it wasn't falsified, but it was limited. And I'll explain why in a moment. It contributed to an understanding that lauded her sanctity, but it glossed over the struggles that brought her to that sanctity. Through the selected published memoirs and the lack of further information about the saint, there was an inadvertent censorship that developed around the presentation of the saint's life. 
For example, most of the earlier editions of her autobiography were heavily modified. A priest writing in a 1958 issue of the Catholic Herald recounts the surprising history behind St. Therese's autobiography, Story of a Soul. This one on that St. Therese asked her religious superior to make whatever changes and editorial corrections that she thought were necessary to her autobiography. So while her sister Mother Agnes certainly had the noblest of intentions in her editorial work, uh, many found that the, the revisions concealed important facets of the saint's life. So again, it was done to prevent scandal. Nothing was falsified, but there were things removed because they didn't know what, if, what uh, reaction they would get from the people of God. And accordingly, the piece goes on and says that they calculated that almost 20,000 words were left out. So it works out to about 50 pages. And again, it was meant to conceal because it conflicted with Mother Agnes's view of what a saint was. You know, a lot of uh, books written on the lives of saints. I'm not sure if you've had this experience. I, I had uh, in, in my life, I found them to be quite, um, quite boring, actually, overly saccharine and um, quite offensive, I think, to the majesty and, and the power of God's grace. For example, I remember in the novitiate once, and I was reading something briefly on the life of Saint uh, Gonzaga, and Therese also had an issue with this. And I remember reading it, and they said that he was so chaste that he didn't even suck his thumb when he was in his mother's womb. And I remember I burst out laughing, and uh, maybe it was quite irreverent at the time, but it, was, it just seemed so ridiculous, because first of all, why is sucking one's thumb in the mother's womb, uh, why would that be considered to be unchaste? Think about it. So, so there was um, this conflicted, right? And many people were, um, were turned off by that. And they should be, again, because God's grace is incredible. And what he wants to do through people, oftentimes writing uh, like straight with crooked lines as well, or is also much more interesting. Okay, so there are other scholars that have pointed out edits that were made to the manuscript. And uh, so the church... The church, the superiors in Rome intervened and they directed that the original manuscripts of the saint be published in order to avoid and to refute partial and mistaken interpretations of St. Therese's doctrine. So what you have in here is everything that she wrote. So there's nothing missing from here, which is good news. All right. So in the records, again, of St. Therese's final words, uh, there's an account of a conversation that she shared and again, she's the same thing, St. Aloysius Gonzaga. She found that it lacked authenticity. And there are many other uh, saints stories uh, that are quite similar. So we hope and pray that um, reading about what really happened to her will give all of you a deep sense of consolation and purpose. Now, something else with regards to um, St. Teresa's uh, trials, right? So she had many trials of faith. And they gave her a unique sympathy for the plight of modern atheists. So this was also a big shock when her sister, who was Mother Agnes, read these things. And this is what she writes. This is a translation from Father Ronald Knox. She says, I get tired of the darkness all around me. The darkness itself seems to borrow from the sinners who live in it, the gift of speech. I hear its mocking accents. It's all a dream, this talk of a heavenly country, of a God who made it all, who is to be your possession in eternity. All right, go on longing for death, but death will make nonsense of your hopes, but it will only mean a night darker than ever, the night of mere non-existence. Could you imagine the horror, right, of Mother Agnes when she read these words? Think about it, hmm? like the, the horror and she thought like this little nun, right? So in her, with her, she, with the crucifix in her hand was tempted to atheism. So St. Therese like in her final agony under the weight of the tuberculosis is often remembered, understandably so, because it was quite powerful. She couldn't breathe, right? So she suffocated to death. Her most piercing trial, according to Pope Benedict XVI, right? It was her passion of the soul with a very painful trial of faith. Her temptations against faith would extend 18 months and only end moments before her death. She described these temptations as ugly serpents hissing in her ears or as clouds of thickest darkness. 
In a conversation with her, her former novices, she confided, I would not even want to tell you the degree of blackness that is in my soul for fear of making you share in my temptations. How absolutely dreadful. You know, and this, if you've ever read um, the beautiful book, Diary of a Country Priest, which I would highly recommend, you can watch the black and white version uh, on YouTube as well. So uh, this country priest goes through a very dark night, similar with, with, uh, like to what Therese of Lisieux went through, what St. John of the Cross went through, what he described and what we studied uh, over, uh, for two months, and we ended it just last month. In January, or beginning of at the end of January, beginning of February, and um, and what you see is that um, they went through this powerful moment, and then um, as the priest right is towards the end of his life, within the last moments, he says "tutte grace." He says everything is grace. So, but it's after a profound right amount of suffering. So this should again again give us courage if we're going through a dark night right now. So. It was a charitable caution that prevented the saint from putting down too much detail into the exact nature of her trials. Again, she says, if you only knew what frightful thoughts obsess me, pray very much for me so that I do not listen to the devil who wants to persuade me about so many lies. It is the reasoning of the worst materialists that is imposed upon my mind. So even though she may not have read, right, uh, Karl Marx or Nietzsche, so she still... She was a child of that generation. She was, of course, very much protected by her family life. Um, however, it seems like she was a true suffering soul. So like she was picking up in her spiritual sensitivity, which remained, right? she was picking up on the things that were going on around her as well. So the Lord chose her as a victim soul. And, and she, but she did realize though, thank God, right from having studied John of the Cross, that to, uh, having thoughts, no matter how evil the thoughts may be, are not sinful. They're absolutely dreadful and painful, but they are not sinful if you do not consent to them. So this is one of the teachings, right? The parental teachings of the church has taught to us through many of the great saints, including St. John of the Cross and the Desert Fathers. All right, so during these great temptations, she never wavered in faith. And she resolutely offered everything to obtain the light of faith for poor unbelievers, for all those who separate themselves from the church's beliefs. And Pope Benedict goes on and he says that heroic fidelity in these struggles was marvelous. He says, with Mary beside, Je beside the cross of Jesus, Therese then lived the most heroic faith as a light in the darkness that invaded her soul. The Carmelite was aware that she was living this great trial for the salvation of all the atheists of the modern world, whom she called brothers. And uh, you'll recall from chapter two, I think it was, uh, like her desire, right, for when, uh, to pray for other people, to intercede for others, for the poor man, right, who refused alms because he didn't think he was poor enough. And then for Pranzini, when he wants to die unrepentant, and then she's begging God for his salvation, right? So she's able to see that, and she has a desire, so she wants everyone to be saved. And therefore, she uh, accepts the suffering and offers it to God. Again, how instructive for us, especially during a pandemic and during our second uh, Lent during, a, during this pandemic as well. St. Therese understood temptations to suicide. There's a sort of a pious myth that pretends that devout souls never experience the dark temptations. St. Paul of the Cross, he had to uh, suppress the desire to lunge himself out of his own bedroom window, if you can imagine. He too had temptations towards suicide. In the imaginations of some, it's almost unthinkable that even the thought of temptations to grave sin could enter into the minds of the saintly. Again, it's the devil that is operating here. And what's important is that we do not consent to, the, uh, to these evil thoughts. What we do is we say to Jesus, we say, Lord, these are the thoughts that are coming into my mind. They're, they're troubling me so but I do not consent to them. So therefore, Lord, I surrender them to you. I pray that you, you drench me with your most sacred blood. Mary, please cover me with your mantle and protect me and move forward. Move forward. Don't obsess over it. You just add more power. Right? You just give more power, more energy to these thoughts. Okay, so, and she, even, she said herself, she said, look, she goes, I would have committed suicide without an instant hesitation because of the incredible amount of pain that she was experiencing physically. 
right? physically. But we have to pray and reach out, especially to the many people who unfortunately uh, opt for, for uh, assisted suicide. Huh? They kill themselves or they have other people, they force others to kill them in hospital, uh, thinking that it's going to be better for them. And it's not. You know, no, may, may every person die in a state of grace. But we have a responsibility, my brothers and sisters, as Christians in particular, to be able to be of support and help people know that it's worth living and it's worth uh, it's worth enduring the pain of the suffering united to Jesus because of the fruitfulness, right? The spiritual fruitfulness that it will bring. But we have to pray and we can also sympathize with the pain that others feel. Again, Therese is a wonderful patroness for those who are contemplating suicide and that are in agony. In the last days before her beatification, right? So three days before she died, she's a, uh, one, of the, one of the people giving testimony said, I saw her in such pain that I was heartbroken. When I drew near to her bed, she tried to smile. And in a strangled sort of voice, she said, if I didn't have faith, again, I could never bear such suffering. I'm surprised there aren't more suicides among atheists. She said, please take this medicine away from me because she, she was tempted to poison herself. All right, moving onwards. So St. Therese struggled with her prayers and her devotions as well. Every time she picked up her rosary and went into chapel, uh, it was not an occasion for her to fly into ecstasy. Huh? She prayed with her will. Right, One aspect of her life, again, uh, which was taken out of her initial uh, publication of her, of her autobiography, which is quite funny, is, again, the difficulties that she faced in prayer. And many books have been written on this. And all of us have gone, uh, like, struggled in prayer uh, for different reasons during different periods of our lives. So she said, I feel then the fervor of my sisters make up for my lack of fervor. But when I am alone, I am ashamed to admit it. The recitation of the rosary is more difficult for me than the wearing of an instrument of penance. I feel I have said this so poorly. I force myself in vain to meditate on the mysteries of the rosary. I don't succeed in fixing my mind on them. So she was in agony right, because of this. She said, for a long time, I was desolate about this lack of devotion, which astonished me, for I love the Blessed Virgin so much that it should be so easy for me to recite in her honor prayers, which are so pleasing to her. Now I am less desolate. I think that the Queen of Heaven, since she is my mother, must see my goodwill and she is satisfied with it. Sometimes when my mind is in such aridity that it is impossible to draw forth one single thought to unite me with God, I very slowly recite in our Father and then a Hail Mary. And then these prayers give me great delight. They nourish my soul much more than if I had recited them precipitately a hundred times. Okay, so uh, this can happen very often. It's like, well, what am I going to do? What do I say? Right? So St. Paul says that the Holy Spirit prays in us in ways that we can't even understand. We don't know how to pray. Right? So prayer isn't a technique. It's, uh, it's an abandonment to God and allowing the Holy Spirit to pray in us and through us. Asking Jesus to pray in us to the Father. The Trinity lives in us through our baptism. Right, as Elizabeth of the Trinity reminds us of over and over again. One of the most beautiful things you can do is if you come to chapel, we're open seven days a week, six days a week, we have adoration. Come in, sit in front of the Lord, just plop yourself there, sit down, kneel, and say, you know, Lord, I'm here. I'm here. We don't have to say much, just be present. And just because we don't necessarily understand or can perceive on an emotional level, right, on an effective level, what God is doing, He's working. We just need to be here and we can say something very simple. You know, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Simple words, right? All is grace. All is grace. Pick up scripture, read a verse, and then just sit in his presence. All right. And something funny, St. Therese was a very difficult child, right? She writes beautiful things. She was very loved, like very much loved by her family. But she was a real pain. So she'd be a consolation to parents with difficult children. Her mother, right, a letter sorry, from her mother, uh, which was read during the beatification, process of beatification, um, stated the following. I, had to I have to slap this poor baby when, who gets into frightening furies when she cannot have her own way. She rolls about on the ground in despair as if all were lost. She's a very nervy child. St. Therese also relates other anecdotes. She says, my parents weren't even able to say to me, she's good when she's asleep, because at night I was more restless than during the day, throwing myself in all directions and banging against the wood while sleeping. The pain would awaken me and I'd cry out, mama, I bumped myself. 
This happened repeatedly and so much that they had to tie me in bed. And so every evening, little Selim came to tie me up to prevent the little rascal from bumping herself. This was so successful, it means that I was from then on good when sleeping. So you're probably wondering, like, what, what's all of this about? Well, if you read Holiness in Context uh, from Father Foley, um, he analyzes uh, in depth her early life. And there's something very interesting that, uh, here that you don't get in her, in her journal. And it has to do with the fact that once she was born, so her, during her whole, um, her mother's pregnancy, her mother was very nervous because she was afraid that Therese, right, was going to die as well. She was going to die either in utero or she was going to die shortly thereafter because she had lost other children. So she was so anxious about this that she was communicating all of this anxiety, which we know happens, this nonverbal anxiety to the child, so to Therese. And Therese constantly felt this anxiety emanating from her mother, even though her mother tried her best to hide it. So Therese was so freaked out, she wouldn't eat. So her mother had a wet nurse. So then she was separated from her mother and then she went to the wet nurse and then she was with the wet nurse. And then afterwards she was taken from the wet nurse and given back to her mom. So then she had all of these separations and they had a traumatic impact on her life. So even though she couldn't verbalize it till afterwards, it nevertheless affected her, um, which can partly explain uh, why she was the way she was. Okay, so this is just a bit of a background. We'll go into greater detail as we go through the chapters. So now we look at the table of contents as you can see them in the book. So there are 11 chapters and an epilogue and there's the victim of divine love. Uh, Father Gailey has a beautiful book called uh, 33 Days to Merciful Love. Uh, it is a, a consecration, a prayer of consecration, uh, which ends with the prayer of the self-oblation that Therese herself made to God. And it's recommended that you do it at one point in time. You could even do it during over the next few weeks as well, if you'd like. So the first chapter is at, uh, is on Anesson and then the Boussonet. Chapter three is on the distressing years. Chapter four, first communion and boarding school. Chapter five is after the grace of Christmas. Chapter six, the trip to Rome. Chapter seven, the first years in Carmel. Uh, chapter eight, um, sorry, seven. Chapter eight, profession and offering to merciful love. Chapter nine, my vocation is love. And then chapter 10, the trial of faith. And chapter 11, those who, uh, whom you have given me. And then this epilogue. So we have all of this that we're going to look through. So again, please read the assigned chapters. Lenita is going to send you these slides at, uh, either tonight or tomorrow morning. So you'll be able to go through them. And so you were asked to read chapters one and two for tonight. Uh, for March the 8th, please read chapters three and four. And then and the rest that are there. So you can go into that yourselves, please. And make notes along the way. <clears throat> Just some further uh, information about how it was written. There were three manuscripts. So there's manuscript A, which was written for Reverend Mother Agnes of Jesus, chapters one and eight. Manuscript B was written for Sister uh, Marie of the Sacred Heart. So that would be chapters nine. And then manuscript C was written for Mother Marie de Gonzague. And that would be chapter chapters 10 and chapter 11. So those two as well. So three different manuscripts. You can get into more details when you read uh, the book itself. So now we go to Anesson, France. How beautiful. Uh, we can't wait for the day when we can start to travel once again. Okay, so chapter one. Now, please understand this is not an exhaustive presentation of the first two chapters. This is also for the sake of time, okay? And then um, it, the hope and the prayer is that you're going to be reading them, you're going to be highlighting, making notes, and then reading the questions and the commentaries uh, at the end of each chapter. What I've tried to do is excerpt certain passages, uh, which, um, which seem to be, um, I guess, an adequate summary of the, of the presentation of the chapter. You may disagree, that's absolutely fine, uh, but these were commented on also by other, um, by other authors. And for that reason, I wanted to present them. Now, what you'll see is that there isn't a, uh, an immediate presentation of the little way because the doctrine of the little way was something that uh, kind of took time to develop. And it was only towards the end of her death that Therese really kind of understood it and was able to, to put it to paper. And she realized, the Lord revealed to her, that this was something that everyone had to know about. Okay, so these are some 
some excerpts. So she says, it is to you, dear mother, to you who are doubly my mother, that I come to convey the story of my soul. Jesus has made me feel that in obeying simply, I would be pleasing him. She didn't want to do it, but out of obedience, she did. She listened to an objective, like to her, to her superior, to someone who, uh, like her, uh, a lawful authority, if you want to use that term. She realized that her, the mother superior had been put there to help her in her life to grow as a nun, right? Not to, to destroy her life, but to help her flourish as a nun. And therefore she listened, even though at times she didn't understand why she was told to do certain things. She trusted that God was working through her. That's something good for all of us to reflect upon. And then she goes on and she says, I shall begin to sing what I must sing eternally in heaven, the mercies of the Lord. Before taking the pen, I knelt before the statue of Mary and begged her to guide my hand, that it trace no line displeasing to her. Then opening the Holy Gospels, my eyes fell on these words. And going up to a mountain, he called to him men of his own choosing, and they came to him. This is the statue, right, uh, that smiled at her when she received that great miracle of healing. And then she goes on. She says, he does not call those who are worthy, but those who who he ple uh, sorry, whom he pleases. This is great because, uh, and we can say, I can say as a priest, and I know many others, um, it's not out of false humility, it's the reality. God doesn't choose the best. St. Paul says God chooses the garbage of the world, the refuge of the world, what is weak in the world. Why? Because he wants us to realize that it is a sheer gift to be called to a specific vocation. Right? It's not because of any natural qualities on our part. And she goes on and she says, I wondered why for a long time, uh, like why their God has preferences. She says, why all the souls don't receive an equal amount of graces. Jesus deigned to teach me this mystery. He set before me the book of nature. I understood how all the flowers he created are beautiful, how the splendor of a rose and the whiteness of the lily do not take away the perfume of the little violet or the delightful simplicity of the daisy. I understood that if all flowers wanted to be roses, Nature would lose her springtime beauty, and the fields would no longer be decked out with little wild flowers. Isn't that interesting huh, when you look at it from that perspective? If all we ever had were roses, it would be rather boring, would it not? And so it is with the world of souls, Jesus' garden. She says what is truly perfect, right, it consists in doing his will, in being what he wills us to be. When we want to be something that other than who we truly are created to be, it leads to frustration, right? So if we're deeply frustrated in our spiritual lives, in our life in general, then maybe we should reconsider what we're doing, hmm? reconsider what we're doing, how we're living, the interior attitudes that we have. Perhaps we're not following through on God's will for us. It is not then my life properly so-called that I'm, a, I'm going to write. It is my thoughts on the graces God deigned to grant me. I find myself at a period in my life when I can cast a glance on the past. My soul is matured in the crucible of exterior and interior trials. She's writing this months before she dies, and she's getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And her sister had asked her to write this because she wanted to have a record of these memories also for the sake of her her blood sisters that were living in the convent as well, to remember the beautiful times of childhood. She says, God was pleased, was pleased all throughout my life to surround me with love and the first memories I have stamped with smiles and the most tender caresses. It was a quote that we had earlier. And here's something to think about, okay? So St. Therese often quotes from letters that she kept from her childhood. That was one of the things that struck me. Now, how often do we write letters, right? Emails, social media posts are virtual. No, and they disappear quickly, like TikTok, whatever it is. So what memories will we have in of this present time 20 years from now? Right? What are we going to have? Probably nothing. So now's a good time to start writing letters once again and keeping them. Not even just for ourselves, but for the sake of posterity, for future generations, for our family members. You know, God calls everyone to sanctity. It's not a joke. He calls everyone to sanctity, to become saints, 
uh, my, my spiritual father, uh, Monsignor Haddock, uh, he was a physicist. He lived down the street here. And he said that you're supposed to live your life so that when you die, the church could begin the process of canonization. All right. Now, so St. Therese was very close to her siblings. Again, another blessing. And she writes, I have often heard it said that surely Pauline would become a religious and without knowing too much about what it meant, I thought I too will be a religious. So again, she's two years old. She hears this, right? So she responds and you can think, oh, it's so cute, right? It was, I remember when I was, when my niece was two years old and I said to her, I go, Natalie, I said, who are you going to marry when you get older? She goes, I'm going to marry you, Zio. And we started laughing. I thought, uh, no, yeah, but we're not going to explain it to a two-year-old correct? She's not going to understand it. So you can say, well, is this providence? Is this God speaking through her? Who knows? But she was formed, right? She was formed by people who were madly in love with the Lord. And when you're around people who are madly in love with the Lord, really in love with God, then it's going to have a positive impact on us. And she writes to her sister, who's the mother of the community. She says, you were my ideal. I wanted to be like you. And it was your example that drew me toward the spouse of virgins at the age of two. But again, as we heard, she was very stubborn and overly emotional. Her mother writes, uh, her intelligence is superior to Celine's, but she's less gentle and has a, sub a stubborn streak in her that is almost invincible. When she says no, nothing can make her give in. And one could put her in the cellar a whole day and she'd sleep there rather than say yes. So with a nature such as my own, she writes, I had been reared by parents without um, had I been reared by parents without virtue, or even if I had been spoiled by the maid Louise as Celine was, I would have become very bad and perhaps have even been lost as I have. I had excessive self-love and also a love of the good. As soon as I began to think seriously, which I did when still very little, it was enough for one to tell me a thing wasn't good and I had no desire to repeat it twice. Again, Blessed is she, right? How many times do we have to go to confession with, with this and repeat the same sins, right? Confess the same sins over and over again. All right, this is a very cute episode in her life. She says, one day, Leonie, thinking she was too big to be playing any longer with dolls, oh, spelling mistake, sorry, came to us with a basket filled with dresses and pretty pieces for making others. Her doll was resting on top. Here, my little sisters choose. I'm giving you all this. Celine stretched out her hand and took a little ball of wool that pleased her. After a moment's reflection, I stretched out mine saying, I choose all. And I took the basket without further ceremony. We can say, okay, well, she's being selfish. But, but see how a little girl, okay, yes, she's writing years after the fact, but as a young girl, she was already gifted with contemplation. And she was able to see, like make connections between all these things, right? Always from the perspective of eternity. She, goes, she writes, this little incident of my childhood is a summary of my whole life. Later on, when perfection was set before me, I understood that to become a saint, one had to suffer much. Seek out always the most perfect thing to do and forget self, I understood too. There were many degrees of perfection and each soul was free to respond to the advances of our Lord, to do little or much for him in a word, to choose among the sacrifices he was asking. Then as in the days of my childhood, I cried out, my God, I choose all. I don't want to be a saint by halves. I'm not afraid to suffer for you. I fear only one thing, to keep my own will. So take it for I choose all that you will. See that? So already, as a young girl, she was able to make those connections. Okay. And then she has this dream. And a soul in a state of grace has nothing to fear from demons who are cowards, capable of fleeing before the gaze of a child. So it's this childlike, not childish, even though she was childish, she grew out of that, but childlike confidence. So see how God always saves what is good and he purifies us. So he was purifying Therese of her sin, her childishness, and he was making her into a confident child of the Heavenly Father. All right, so these are some questions, but I'll represent them afterwards. Now we go to the Boussonette in France. So this was the, uh, the home that she lived in. It's absolutely beautiful. There's the parlor and there's a rose garden. I don't see any uh, lilies in there, but nevertheless, 
um, you can see a statue of Selene with her father there, so whom she loved deeply. She writes, all of the details of my mother's illness are still present to me, and I recall especially the last two weeks she spent on earth. The touching ceremony of the last anointing is, is also deeply impressed on my mind. The day the church blessed the mortal remains of our dear mother, now in heaven, God willed to give me another mother on earth. He willed also that I choose her freely. So her sister chose her other sister. And then she says, well, as for me, it's Pauline who will be my mama. And she says, I have already said, it's from the end of this phase of my life that I entered the second period of my existence. The most painful of the three, especially since the entrance into Carmel of the one whom I chose to be my mama. All right. And she goes on and she says, I must admit mother, my happy disposition completely changed after mama's death. Again, Father Foley talks about this extensively in his other book on how her mood, complete, she just completely changed, right? So whatever, like the, the weaknesses in her came out. She says, I who was once full of life became timid and retiring, sensitive to an excessive degree. One look was enough to reduce me to tears and the only way I was content was to be left alone completely. I could not bear the company of strangers and found joy only within the intimacy of the family. So she kind of closed herself off from everyone else. She just, she couldn't do it. And it was her father's very affectionate heart that seemed to uh, be enriched now with a truly maternal love. Her father was a very gentle, very, very gentle soul, a very holy man. And when you read again, the hidden face, what you'll see is that um, there's mention about this. And it says that he was gentle and shy and he was guided more by others' decisions than by his own. And we hear that Zeline, uh, his wife, she was the stronger partner and the leader within the marriage with regards to the business and many things as well. So it's interesting how like they work together, but then he had to also take on that role as well. Her days were spent taking walks with her father. They visited the Eucharistic Christ in different churches. How beautiful, huh? the idea of taking a walk with your kids, your family members, uh, your friends and going to go to the different churches, popping in and, uh, and saying hi to the Lord in the tabernacle. Something to, to consider doing, to, to start over again, huh? And giving alms to the poor. This is not just reserved for Lent, but this has to be part of our daily bread. She says, during my, uh, my walks with Papa, she said she, he loved to have me bring alms to the poor we met on the way. So thoroughly Christian. Her father instilled in her an authentic understanding of what it means to love both God and neighbor. And we hear in Matthew, right, the gospel according to Matthew, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And she goes and she recounts a story. I really wanted, she gave this um, she gave money to a poor man. He refused it because he said that he wasn't poor enough. He was unworthy of that, imagine. And then she remembered, right, having been told that on your first communion, that you can receive a specific grace that you ask for. So she decided, right, she was only six years old at the time. She says, I'm going to pray for this poor man on the day of my first communion. And five years later, she kept that promise. Pray for him. So each week, right, and she goes on, each week brought one that was very dear to my heart, namely Sunday. And she says, what a day Sunday was for me. So living with her family, prayer, visits to the Blessed Sacrament, caring for the poor, right? So at least she wasn't being totally insular. The father was taking her out and going to church on Sunday. I know not everywhere you can go to Mass on Sunday yet, uh, but you can still come for communion service. Mm -hmm. and render the day hallow, right? God wants the day to be holy. How many of us are so busy doing so many things on Sunday rather than resting in the Lord, having time with the family, and just wasting time? Not binge-watching Netflix, of course. Even if it's something uh, like a Bible series, like you shouldn't spend all your time on social media either. Just relax, be present to God, and rest. And you'll probably have a better week as a consequence of that anyways. Okay, so, um, so she's there. She's listening to homilies. She doesn't understand them. But the first one she understands when she's very young was one on the passion. 
you see that? So she was, I think, six years old uh, at the time. People say, no, we have to spare children from, from all these things. No, children, they already have the capacity to love. They understand suffering. They may not be able to articulate it well. But if you see, like she saw her mother, her, her deceased mother with her own eyes. So she had to do that. And that was something that marked her, but she was also able to see reality for what it was. And you know, life isn't always uh, easy, right? Oftentimes it can be very difficult as well. But even the Virgin Mary, when she appeared in Fatima, I have a beautiful statue in front of me. The Virgin Mary showed uh, a five-year-old hell. She showed them that. And it wasn't so much for them, but she showed them, she said, look, this is where many people go. And they were so moved by that. They were so moved out of love for God and for their neighbor that they sacrificed themselves for others so that they would not go to hell. That's true love for God and neighbor. Okay. And then there's another incident she writes. And she says, once I was surprised that God didn't give equal glory to all the elect in heaven. She says, my dear mother helped me understand that in heaven, God will grant his elect as much glory as they can take. The last having nothing to envy in the first. Some are like a tumbler that's full, others like a thimble. The reality is that you're full. And that depends on what God gives, right? It's his decision. But all of us are called to be fully alive and happy in the Lord. And in the end, that's part of the mystery, right? So uh, one other event in her life, she had this vision. This was a vision that took place during the day. And it was something that marked her at a very young age. So she writes that she saw, uh, she thought she saw her father. And there was a man that was walking across, like outside. And she sensed that there was something seriously wrong. She was horrified and she started screaming out for her father as well. And she knew that something was wrong. She didn't know why it was happening. And, uh, but her father was on a business trip. And it was only afterwards that she realized that God was giving her a premonition of them, something that was going to happen in the future. And she goes, I don't understand it. Why did God allow me to, uh, to, to see this, right? Um, that would have almost made me die of grief. But she says, this is one of the mysteries that we shall understand only in heaven, in which we shall eternally admire not be bitter and resentful, but admire. And she goes on and she says, how good God really is, how he parcels out trials only according to the strength he gives us. God will never test us beyond our strength, as scripture, as scripture says, right? The Lord says it through the, uh, through the mouth of St. Paul. And here's another thing, the beauty of nature, huh? how nature can point to God. Nature is not God because we're not pantheists, but it can lead us to God. And she writes, she says, never will I forget the impression the sea made on me. I couldn't take my eyes off it since its majesty, the roaring of the waves. Everything spoke to my soul of God's grandeur and power. Nature brought her closer. And again, how extraordinary that she had the gift of contemplation from a very young age. This is something that we're called to cultivate in children as well. And pray that they don't lose, lose that sense of wonder. It's so sad when you see children with hard eyes, eh? like cynical eyes, that they've lost that. It's, it's a horrible, horrible thing uh, to see. Mm -hmm. And then she ends the second chapter by writing. She says, my life passed by tranquilly and happily. The affection with which I was surrounded at Le Poussinet helped me to grow. I was undoubtedly big enough now to commence the struggle, to commence knowing the world and the miseries with which it filled, which it was filled. So she understood suffering, huh? She wasn't the, um, the, well, the impression that we get when we look at some of her images of this kind of plaster saint who never experienced anything difficult in her life. In fact, it's not true. And I hope that you've gotten a sense of that so far in this uh, presentation. All right, so here are a couple of discussion questions. And again, um, not everyone probably read the first two chapters, that's okay. And so the questions are the following. So there's a lot of wisdom in what um, we've, we've gleaned from the first two chapters. And what St. Therese, like, when looking back on her life, um, it comes to know is that it's better, right? It's better to reflect on the blessings and not on the difficulties alone, right? So, and when we look back and we learn to, to cultivate gratitude, we become happier. So when was the last time that you reflected upon how truly blessed you are in life? That's the first question. And the second one is, 
At what times in your life have you been confronted with the choice of doing the will of God despite your fears? So with that, I'm going to turn this over now to, to, uh, to Sandy. I'm going to leave this on the screen. And then Sandy's going to explain how um, you'll have time for the, um, the, the sharing and the, and, the group, and the groups as well. So go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Father Peter, for leading us in that um, first session of our book study.